it was basically talking about Ibn Fadlan, who was a Muslim scholar from Baghdad. He traveled to yeah. a Viking society in, in what is now Russia, basically. And he learned about the Vikings and just hearing about his, reading about his perception, because he wrote everything down that he saw and witnessed, and reading about how disgusted yet academic, he was very intellectual and academic, but he was disgusted by the Vikings' way. It was very interesting and very fun to read it. It was like a, everyone looks a fish out of water story or a person in a new society, feeling like an alien in a new society and seeing how he tried to <laughs> reconcile the way the Vikings were acting, but trying to be an unbiased scholar and just recording everything. It's a very interesting story. Assalamu alaikum all and welcome to another episode of the Optimized Muslim podcast interview series. Alhamdulillah, today very happy to be joined by Brother Muttaqi Ismail from Islamic History Podcast. Assalamu alaikum and jazakallah khair for joining today. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Brother Adil, for, join, for inviting me to your podcast and your show. I'm very honored and hopefully we can learn something from each other today. No, you shouldn't say you're very honored because I have oh, to yeah. say this. I have to say this. Let me just stop you there because okay. <laughs> I have interviewed like the Daniel Heihadju and Gabriela mm -hmm. Romani yeah. and obviously they're more well-known personalities. And with those personalities, I sometimes, even though I've been impacted by them a lot, you don't want to be too open in saying that because a lot of people... You get like was was saying that perhaps you're only doing that because they're famous and they got a following. So I try to keep it minimum, but with yourself, I can say I have so much respect for you and so much love for you. I have to say this because it's like, we'll get into the podcast, but like normally people leave this till the end, but I had to say it because you know how like sometimes when you're with someone who has done really good work or beneficial work, right? Or you're with someone who's like really talented, but then Every, a lot of people around you, they might be just walking past and you're like thinking, do you know who like this person is? That's how I feel because the amount of work that you've done, Alhamdulillah, like may Allah reward you. I mean. The podcast, when I first came across it, 2019, 2020, I got hooked onto it. And Alhamdulillah, man, it's uh, people will definitely link it. It's the Islamic history podcast. People need to check it out and it's, uh, and you've also got a Sira podcast as well. So just to explain how I first came across it, I just found it on one of the podcast applications because I was big into listening to various different podcasts from self-development, mainly like non-Muslim. And then obviously there's a few Islamic podcasts that became quite popular. Yeah, I think I listened to most of them, but it was about two years ago because I remember I did message you to try and get you on in 2020, but then I just went off. I know you said you were willing to, but then I just left the whole podcast scene. And uh, so I listened to them and I was just looking at my notes actually on Evernote that I made from some of them. And I made notes on like the, the episode on Karbala or, and Ibn Zubair's rise like the Sunnis and Shias, what happened after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's death, like the Ridda Wars, and then something on Persians, Byzantines, N Nation of Islam, and also uh, Khalid bin Walid's tactics in war. So I made these notes, but you forget it because it's been two years since I've... Yeah, I've but, got um... <laughs> made them. <laughs> yeah, I've so anyway, mm -hmm. I just wanted to say, get that out of the way, but now turning it back to yourself and just give us a brief kind of background i did watch your podcast with brother ma this was yes. new to me but i watched it yesterday so i know a bit more but for the sake of the audience if you mm -hmm. could give like some information about yourself your background and kind of a synopsis of like your trajectory up to now sure sure as people can probably tell from my voice i am from the united states of america i currently live in the atlanta metro area i was born in a city called Birmingham, Alabama, not the one in the UK. Birmingham, Alabama, which is famous for the civil rights movement back in the 1960s. My parents both were born Christian, but they converted to Islam before I was born, like in the late 60s, early 70s or so. And so I was born Muslim, but mostly raised in Brooklyn, New York. And so even though I was born in Birmingham, most of my childhood was in New York City. While in New York City, my mother, who was, once again, she, was, she converted to Islam in her early to mid twenties or so. 
she decided to uh, send me to Senegal, West Africa, to study Islam. Me and my sisters. I have two. I have three younger sisters. We all. I have many more than that, but three of us went to Africa to study. Well, yeah, three of us went to Africa to study. It's, it's been so many years that I keep my numbers. Three of us went to Africa to, to study. We were in Senegal, West Africa. We studied there for about three years or so, mostly memorized Quran hifs. I didn't finish the Quran, but we got very far with it. Basic Islamic studies, memor- had the same thing that most Islamic schools go through. And then we went on to uh, Trinidad, which has a Surprisingly, has a large Muslim population in comparison to other Caribbean islands. Thanks to the British, the British have done a lot of, a lot of transporting people around the world. But there's a good lot, a number of Muslims in Trinidad, and they had a Muslim school there called Dado Alum Trinidad and Tobago. And my sisters and I went there. I only went through what's known as, I think the British system they call it Form, Form Two, I think, Form Two. Okay. I forgot the form, something like that. But I only went through basically what's considered high school level in the United States. My sisters went on to graduate all the way through. They became alimat, actually. There are two of them are actually alimat. They finished the whole Islamic studies program. I came back to the United States, went on to school, regular college, got married, had a bunch of kids, got into the workforce. Sometime, maybe about 10 years ago, I started getting into creating my own content, generally Islamic history, but I didn't really have, the technology wasn't to the, where the point where I could really do what I wanted to do. And so I did what I could with it, but around 2015, I really want to get more into Islamic history. I was already doing a, like a personal Islamic journey kind of thing, Islamic advice. It was a podcast, basically. It was a po- an Islamic advice podcast, but I want, I really want to focus more on Islamic history. The background of that is that my mother was a history teacher in the New York City public school system. So I grew up with history textbooks for the, for the public school, but still, they, I grew up around them all the time. And so I always, many people hate history, but I would actually read my mother's old history textbooks all over the house all the time for fun. And I've always enjoyed history, particularly how warfare has come and politics and economics and how the, decision, the decisions of some great man, and I'm great in the, in the worldwide sense, not necessarily that he would have been a good man, but some great man did something that changed the trajectory of history, whether it was Alexander the Great or Genghis Khan, or of course, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or something like that, to change the course of history. And I've always been impact, love those sort of things. And also, I got to say that the events of 9-11, after that, as I mentioned, I, I grew up in, in New York City. So my, my wife actually used to work at the World Trade Center. And when we were recording, I used to pick her up from work. And we was, she would sometimes take me to the top of the observation deck in, at the World Trade Center. So this is only a few, this is like 1998, 1999. And the towers were knocked down in 2001. So it was only a few years apart. But after the towers came down, after the attack of 9-11, there was, of course, lots of vitriol against Muslims. Lots of talk about just so many things just warping Muslim his- Islamic history and Muslim history. Particularly, it was around that time the Second Intifada began in Palestine as well. So there was a lot of messaging regarding what was happening in Israel and Palestine and I just, it was just frustrating to hear these things about Muslims and not being able to counter them because I really didn't know the history. When television tells you one thing, you assume the television is telling the truth. But even if the the television is not telling you the truth, if you don't know it yourself, you have no way of countering it. And so Mm. there'll be all these stories about how the Muslim society has failed. And people have to understand this is in the midst of the war and, or just beginning the, the war in Iraq the whole George Bush, the second era, very anti-Muslim at, the, at that time, even in, especially in the United States. So it was very, it was a time when I just had, I just got tired of hearing all these things against Muslims and Islamic history and about our history. So I decided to do some research. And by the time I actually got into this podcast, I had more books and everything. So a lot of my long story short is my reasoning for wanting to do an Islamic history podcast was to counter these feelings that I had. I know I felt very, I guess, unsubstantial. I felt unable to counter the lies that people were saying about Islam. And sometimes the Muslims say about Islam also. Sometimes we sometimes go too far in, in trying to make whitewash or try to make, thing, make it seem that everything in Islam was perfect until colonialism came. It wasn't. Everything, Islam is perfect. Muslim society was not always perfect. Let me correct myself. Everything in Muslim society was not perfect before colonialism came. But definitely colonialism did a lot to harm Muslim society. But my point was that to give Muslims a more nuanced, a more outlook, a a fairly unbiased outlook on history without being 
Of course, I'm Muslim, so I, I know I will be biased for the Muslim side, but still trying to understand the mistakes that, that we have made as Muslims so we can try to fix those things, but also to counter the lies and the propaganda of those who are against Islam. And it was never, it was always, my, my goal is never to try to give a pure, pristine idea of how Islamic society or Muslim society was in the past, but to give a balanced view. My, my overriding ideology is that if we are right, we can tell the truth and acknowledge our wrongs, but still come out. And in the case of, especially of Israel and Palestine, when you hear the history, you can see the mistakes that the Arabs and the Muslims had made at that time. But even with all the mistakes, even with all the things that they did wrong, there's no one with common sense with an unbiased view can say that this is the Palestinians' fault, or the Israelis are completely right in their treatment of the Palestinians. They're completely justified. So no one in their right mind could say that. And so that's the kind of point I wanted to get Muslims away from trying to give everything a completely rosy view about our history, but also to counter the lies and propaganda from those who are against Islam. I'm into psychology as well, so... I like to, I find these things really interesting, like the confluence of factors that leads to someone being how they are. I know others, if others follow this podcast, they probably share similar interests because I've been talking about it for a while. So I'm interested in like how, when I watched your podcast with Brother Mark, I was quite like surprised to hear some of the stuff in your background about traveling to Senegal and stuff. But then it's like the, a piece, it's like pieces of the puzzle that come together. Because I was always wondering like how you got started into this and like the motivation and everything. And obviously now you've just touched on the motivation, which explains a lot because you have to have a deep why and like some pain that kind of pushes you. And yeah. especially with something like this that I can imagine, I know even having a talking podcast where a lot of the research is completely a lot less than something that you have to do in terms of history and putting together a script and like making sure it's accurate it's a completely different level in terms of work that gives me an appreciation for how much work it is and to be able to do that you have to have a something deep kind of pushing you in at least at the start anyway where there's not much traction so what i wanted to and then obviously the element about you saying how your mother was a history teacher that's like another piece because then obviously that's yeah. influenced your mindset and stuff. And then the bit that's most different or most untypical is the, the trip to Senegal. So were you 15, did you say, when you went to Senegal? Yes, there was a lot of different reasons for that one. When, see, I was in New York City, international city. Many people from all over the world come to New York City to reside and live similar to London. There's a large Senegalese, West African community in parts of New York City. And they tend to settle where... The, I don't know how to put it, but the indigenous or the local black Americans. Okay. Yeah. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of intermingling between black Americans, Africans, and then African people of African descent from the Caribbean in New York City. There's a lot of intermingling between because they live in the same areas. So my mother also, my mother lived at, during the time, I'm sure you and most people are aware of the civil rights movement in the United States. As I mentioned, my family's from the South and the South back in the city is different now. Back in the 50s and 60s, 40s, 50s and 60s, when my mother was growing up, it was very racist. We know the stories. Black people couldn't go in certain restaurants. They couldn't ride in the front of the bus. They couldn't go to certain schools, had these different bathrooms. So that's how my mother grew up. By the time my mother got into college, she was very, she was part of the civil rights movement that was trying to change the system, protesting, demonstrating some violence, but things to try. And that's actually what brought her to Islam, actually. Running, uh, I don't say running with that crowd, but being in that crowd, she actually told me, I know this is not, this is part of, out of the range of your topic, but we're here now. My, I asked my mother what made her come to Islam. And she told me that when she was a young woman, she maybe in her mid twenties or so, she was with a group of black people who were trying to really change the system in the United States. And they were trying to change the system through very extreme measures, not quite violence, but they would resort to violence if necessary. But some of those people were also Muslim. And she, she grew up in the South where they mostly did nonviolent resistance, protesting, marches, you get beat up by the cops, thrown to jail, come back again, do it again. But she was speaking with Muslims in New York City and they told her that we don't do that sort of thing. We have as a Muslim, we have a right to fight back. We have a right to defend ourselves. And that is what started her gravitation towards Islam. And then 
she said that the man, the brother who was giving her dawah, trying to convince her to become Muslim, she said, let me go home and think about it. And he said, what if you die before you come back tomorrow? And that changed her mind. And so she took shahada on the spot. And it mm. took her a while to, to really get into the religion and start practicing it fully. My mother never really f- even really learned how to read Arabic. She struggled with just reading Arabic throughout her entire life. But she made sure her children could do some Islam. So I'm the author of that. But that's what brought her into Islam. And I, I forgot where I was going with this. But the no, point no, of the matter is... interesting little yeah. um, side... Yeah, my father took a different route, but his route, basically, he was, his family from the South also, but he was born and raised in Chicago and he got into the military and he was always trying to, he always searching for something. So there are lots of little different offshoots of Islam throughout the United States, especially in the black community. There used to be, there aren't as many now, but they're still there. Nation of Islam is one of them. It's like an offshoot of Islam, not true Islam, but adjacent to it in a way. The others, there's black Israelites, the Moors, a couple of other these things. There's all small little, what we would consider her- heretical groups in Islam, but not in Islam, but heretical groups basically. And he went through all of those. He went into the military just before Vietnam. I don't think he served in Vietnam, but he went into the military. He finally got introduced to mainstream Sunni Islam. He joined and he became a Sunni Muslim. He stuck with that. He wasn't into the civil rights movement like my mother was. He was more of a man who was just searching for something. And he finally found Islam and just stuck with it. So that's mm. his journey to us. Like I said, I forgot your original question. No, <laughs> okay. it, was, um, it was about how uh, the journey to Senegal and... Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, so anyway, my uh, mother was... We were in, in uh, Brooklyn, New York. And my mother's always been into... She's never been a fan of the American system. As you can see, she's uh, from her background. She was never, uh, she was, I won't say she's anti-America, but she was never a fan of the American system, mostly from the way she grew up in the American South and then to, the, mm. to her uh, civil rights activities and then becoming Muslim and things like that. The Senegalese, there was a Senegalese group that would have, that was joined for basically, we would call it a Sufi Tariqa in a way. It was a Sufi Tariqa called the Morid in based in Senegal. I don't have to go into the history of the Morid, but basically they would come to certain houses or certain parts of, in New York City and just recite poetry, Islamic, mostly Islamic poetry from their Sheikh Ahmed Bamba, who founded the, that Sufi Tariqa. And again, my mother didn't really know much. She knew how to pray and everything, but she wasn't really knowledgeable in Islam per se, but she just liked being around Muslims who are practicing Islam and being in the African community in a way. And so we spent a lot of time there. Eventually a brother who was wanted to start a program to have American Muslim boys from New York City area go to Senegal and study in more in a more pure environment, I guess. How are you going to put up an environment that connects us to our African past, as well as get us the Islamic learning that we needed and gets us out of the craziness of New York City and the, the United States for a few years. My mother, of course, is all for it. And let's see, that's basically how it went. He, the brother who started up, he was originally from Jamaica, but he lived in the United States. He, he worked with the sheikh in Senegal. They got together a program, hired some teachers, got a, bought a compound and houses for us to stay at. And little by little, he started bringing in a few American boys to go there to study Islam. And that's really how it started. The program had its ups and downs, and but overall, it was definitely beneficial because I don't think I would be half as interested in Islam as I am now if I didn't have that break. I'd probably just be a, a typical American Muslim who's, I don't want to say I'm a great Muslim now, but I don't think I'll be as, as into Islam as I am now without having gone to Senegal. So that was uh, definitely an important respect. That was basically it. Another thing that my mother, from my mother's perspective, she admitted this later on was that New York City was very violent at that time. It was early eight, early 90s or late, I'll say early 90s, really. In the early 90s, um, crime in, in New York City was very bad. Uh, my mother, once again, was a teacher in the New York City public school system. We didn't have school shootings like you hear about in the United States right now, but we did have lots of gang violence in schools anyway, even without the school shootings that we have today. So that's what was my mother's concern because we were in this pretty bad neighborhood in New York City and Kids were young, I was 15, as you said, I was a teenager right about that time where young men get into trouble. And I was not a, I was not a gangster or anything like that. <laughs> not that I don't have that in my system, in my mentality, but I guess she was more concerned about me being, being victimized or getting into trouble. And I do know a lot of young Muslim men from this area, from this era, from this time period who spent long periods of time in jail or still in jail or prison or are in fact dead 
because of the system of violence that was going on in New York City at the time. It still goes on now. Maybe it's less now. I don't know. But so that's one of the reasons that she also sent me. And so she had, she admitted later on that she had to correct her intentions because she admitted her first intention was she was afraid for my life, actually, as a young black man in New York City, that I'll either be mur murdered by other kids or murdered by a cop or be, or get involved with the wrong crowd and then wind up in jail. And that was, those are her concerns at first. But she acknowledged it later on, and may a lot of mercy on her. She eventually, mm -hmm. her intentions, inshallah, and said that once she realized that her original intention was wrong, she corrected to say that she wanted us to, to go overseas to study Islam and not necessarily to save our lives. So I understand her reasoning for both of them. Yeah, Jazakallah Khair. It's always interesting to me how the, I always feel like when someone's somewhat different in terms of the path that they've chosen, or if they've done something that's slightly different, it's always interesting to see how there was like some form of an interruption or some form of something out of the ordinary that happened in their past kind of thing. Because yeah. just recently there was an example in like my own family where they were talking about, so I'm second generation. So like my parents came from Pakistan and it was all like village life going back generations. And they were talking about how for someone there always had to be like an intervention of some sort, not an intervention, but like something out of the ordinary. So like my great, my grandfather went quite high up in the police in Pakistan, in, in Sindh, but he was the only one out of his entire family who'd ever done anything apart from like farming. And the way okay. he did it was he left home at an early age and then he somehow got a job in Karachi with a wealthy uh, English businessman or something. And then mm. by doing that, he was able to get into the police force. And I was just thinking for me, it's interesting to think that there always has to be something out of the ordinary for, because if they were just staying in the village, then obviously the path was the same path. Yeah. I just find that interesting. But anyway, so the next thing I wanted to get onto like Islamic history, because I've also got a lot of questions for you in terms of podcasting and like how you went down that route and stuff. But first, just so that it doesn't get completely dominated on that side, I wanted to ask like. Me personally, I was never really that interested. I know it sounds weird, but some people have a natural interest in Islamic history or like in history in general, perhaps yourself as well. Me personally, I was never about 10 years ago or when I was 16, 17, read a book, lost Islamic history. Yeah, I've heard. Yeah, but other than that, and obviously that was a bit of a revelation for me yeah. because you start learning about these inventions and you also learn about some of the dark side as well, how like certain caliphs were spending most of their resources finding potions that would help them in silly ways and stuff instead of actually focusing on what matters for the ummah. But anyway, aside from that, I didn't really have that deep interest. And then the question that I'm getting to is like, how do you try and teach people, get people to understand the link between Islamic history and like modern problems or like why is Islamic history important? Because the link's not tangible or sometimes you can't really see it unless you research it. How would you tackle that? There's a common perception, especially in the West, that Islamic society has failed and that Muslim society has failed. And the proof of it is simply to point to the Middle East and say, look at the messes going on in the Middle East. So this is proof that Islamic society has failed. And that's a broad generalization. That's assuming, first of all, that the West is not going through its own problems, and it is. That's mm -hmm. one issue. And But secondly, it doesn't really look at how it got to this point. And that there was a point in time when Islamic society was at the top of the world. And it's not just that things are suddenly, that long-term Islamic society just doesn't work. Is much more to it. So the we can take any major issue in the world that involves Muslims right now, whether it's the issue starting from the East, whether it's the issue of, of Kashmir between India and Pakistan, whether it's the many internal fightings within the Middle East, whether it's the Iran problem with Iran and the United States and all the sanctions against Iran and all those things, whether it's the war in Iraq or the multiple wars in Iraq, the civil war in Syria, the civil war in Yemen, the massive change of governments and the things that happened in Egypt a couple about almost 10 years ago now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you can go on and on the problems in Mauritania and parts of Mali with the Boko Haram and things like that going on. No matter how you look at this, all of these things have a history to it. People just didn't wake up one morning and say, I'm going to go out and try and take over the world. I'm going to go out and overthrow the system. There's a whole long history to these things that, that always has a beginning 
It may not really doesn't even have a beginning, but there's always something that leads to something, that leads to something, that leads to something else. So if you just take the issue of Palestine, Israel, that's a very complex history. It's um, as Muslims, of course, we say that the Palestinians are right, but there are many mistakes that the Arab leaders at that time and the Palestinians at that time had made, and even the non-Arab leaders, the Ottoman Empire before that, that had made that led to this situation. And much of the problems that are happening in the Muslim world are branches or branch off from the injustice that's being placed upon the Palestinians now. And there's, for instance, 9-11, those attacks are partially related to what happens in Palestine. So, uh, and the anger the Muslim world has over the situation in Palestine. It's all connected. It's all, there's always a history behind it. My point is that mm. is Muslim society has not necessarily failed. There's very few instances of true Muslim society right now anyway. Furthermore, people don't un sometimes understand that money fixes a lot of problems. <laughs> it doesn't fix every problem, but it fixes a lot of problems. Saudi Arabia, for all of its problems, is one of the most peaceful countries in the world one of the safest countries in the world. There's no civil war happening in Saudi Arabia. Why? Saudi Arabia has a whole lot of money and they're able to keep the populace happy or at least satisfied and able to control much of the problems that other societies are going through. You take Yemen and Syria, those are poor countries. They were poor countries before their civil wars and they're even poorer after the civil wars. The poverty and the problems of poverty were a big deal for those two nations. Iraq was a rich country, but it had a, a leader who was bent on warfare in Saddam Hussein. So that's something different. But generally speaking, people are conflating wealth and the ease that wealth brings. The West is on top because of its wealth. That is, it's not necessarily that democracy or liberalism or any of these things save the, save these societies. It is because of wealth. That is what, it, that is what keeps the West on top and why people are generally happy or at least satisfied throughout much of the Western world. I assure you, if people took away, if you take away the wealth of the United States, we'll be at war within a year, with each other within a year. Mm. It's war can, and war will, war can come, war is usually based on financial reasons, first of all, that's much of the problem. Or internal strife is mostly based on financial reasons. And much of the problems that are happening in the Middle East is not because people are being suffocated by Islam. They're being suffocated by poverty, by injustice, sometimes by tyranny. And there are many other reasons for it. But essentially, the West is on top because of money. Muslim countries that have money, such as Malaysia, Lee, Saudi Arabia, Brunei, these Muslim countries don't have these issues. And they don't have these internal strife. They may not have the quote unquote freedoms that we have, that we consider us having in the West, if you consider those things freedoms, but they're generally happy, generally stable countries. Even in many Muslim countries that are not wealthy, they're still generally stable. Morocco is not a particularly wealthy country, but it's generally stable. I'm trying to think, there, there are others in, around, Indonesia is wealthy though, but there are others also mm -hmm. though that are not particularly wealthy, but they're still fairly stable. So wealth is a, people conflate the wealth of the West, which is much of which is based on colonialism, by the way, stealing from the Eastern mm. countries, with stability and safety and security. And that's not really what it is. It's really the fact that it's really, it's not that the system of the West is better. It's simply that for the past five, 600 years, the West has been able to colonize much of the Muslim world, much of the, the Eastern world in general, extract yeah. its resources and go through with that. So that's really what, yeah. that's really what. I was just going to add to that. It's like, that mindset of the philosophy of secularism or liberalism is superior has somewhat mm -hmm. is sometimes accepted by these formerly colonized nations and people because something i was thinking about recently is and again it, it goes back to wealth and imran Khan, who was the former prime minister of pakistan that's why he had this kind of overtly he his kind of message was that we need to be proud nations standing on our own two feet and then obviously mm -hmm you don't have to subjugate yourself to different countries and like the West and all the rest of it. Because a recent example I was thinking about is just, I think, I don't know how accurate it is, but today I read how Qatar has banned alcohol in the stadiums for the World Cup. Even the other example of how they took the rainbow flag down on, or there was a reaction to that on the embassy. Yeah. And this would, and I was thinking that if I was to compare that with Pakistan, this link, and even 
how Dubai is like now wealthy and there's loads of tourists going there and it's like the top destination for people in the West as well. I feel like even if there's no over Islam kind of in people's faces kind of thing, it's still a good mindset shift in a way because it connects Muslims with wealth again and it's, it connects Muslims with a different identity again. And then it's, you've got people in Pakistan, for example, there's some of them or a lot of them, especially in the media world or like the pop culture world, they still idolize the West in terms of the West values and stuff like that. And I feel like mm -hmm. when they see this and when they travel to these other countries, potentially that have like more of a prouder identity, even Turkey, perhaps they get that kind of understanding that no, it's not all like that. You know what I mean? Like the West isn't necessarily better just because they have these values that have been drummed down into us from like the media and like Hollywood and stuff like that. Just to make it concrete though, because I know you mentioned about how there were certain things in Israel and Palestine, certain mistakes that were made. Just give us one, one major mistake that you can elaborate on in terms of that led mm -hmm. to some problems. Just to give people a concrete example. Okay. Now there are perhaps one of the mistakes was perhaps not negotiating with the, with the Zionists early on. The, now I know there are many people who believe that the, all of Palestine has, the, the Zionists have to, put, have to be pushed out of Palestine completely. All of Israel was now the state of Israel, they have to be pushed out completely. But before it got to this point, there was a point where they could have negotiated and they could have perhaps let, allow the Zionists to have a certain por portion and the Muslims or Arabs have another portion. That was one, but the Arab nations refused to negotiate. And when they did that, they decided to go to war and they wound up losing that war and lost everything. That could have been one point. Another point was, even though no one could have predicted this, was before that, the Ottoman Empire probably shouldn't have gone to war in the first place. <laughs> That's one thing they mm. shouldn't have done. Shouldn't have gone to war to and should not have joined World War One in the first place. Mm. And that once they did that, they lost the area of Palestine to the British, and the British were able to do whatever they wanted to do with it. The British, once the British got control of it, the British government was definitely pro-Zionist. They had a lot of Zionists in there in the government. The the Prime Minister at the time, Chairman George, something or another. I can't remember his name right now. Yeah, George was, Balfour or something, was it? Lloyd George, that's what, Lloyd yeah. George. His a foreign secretary was the guy who wrote the, the document that basically connected Britain with the promise of creating an independent Jewish state in the Middle East. So once that happened, once the British took over, they were able to do whatever they wanted to do with it. And, but if the Ottoman Empire had never gotten into that war in the first place, it would not have happened like, it would not have happened like this. So those are two things that perhaps could have, that would have changed definitely the trajectory of the world had they not happened. The negotiation part is a little more, is a little more difficult because there is, if there's a point in time when the, right around the end, close to the end of World War II, before the British, now throughout this period between the World War I and World War II, there was fighting going on within Palestine between the Zionist immigrants from Europe and the local Muslims, who were mostly Arabs, but not all of them were Arabs per se, who were mostly, who were fighting over land, resources, rights, and everything else. The British control is called Mandatory Palestine. So it was part of the British basic colonial empire, basically. But the British tended to favor the Zionists more than the Arabs, without any doubt. But the British tried to put forward the idea that they were trying to be even-handed with everybody. It didn't quite work. But still, I will say the British were, were at least put across the image that they're trying to be fair. Nonetheless, there was a time after World War II ended, the United Nations was built up. And there was a time where there could have been a way to negotiate a settlement between the two groups where the Palestinians may have had a little, may have had more control and more power than what they have, than what they wound up getting, which is absolutely nothing pretty much. And I know there are many people who believe that they should have been there, period. They should have been gone. All the Jews and should have been pushed out of Palestine, period. I, mm. I understand that. And that's the way we can think that many people think right now. But the fact is that they were already there. The only way to push them out would have been through genocide, basically. It would have been almost difficult, impossible to push them out right then without going to war, which is what they did, and they wound up losing. Mm -hmm. Also, the war, the 1948 war, was not done for Islamic reasons. It was done for nationalist ethnic reasons. It wasn't, there was not a, I don't think there was any concept of this is a war to save Muslims at all. It was a war to save Arabs, to save Arab Palestine. And that mentality changed everything because now, mm -hmm. 
it's a totally different thing. You have the, the Zionists who are already there. By then, many of them have been there for generations now. For them, they're fighting for their lives. Whereas the Arab armies of six or seven nations who sent armies to fight in the 1948 war, they were fighting for, for really for ego. There's really not much to it. Mm -hmm. they, they weren't fighting for Islamic reasons. Certainly they were not. They weren't mm -hmm. fighting for any really noble reason. They're fighting to save Arab dignity. And mm -hmm. that was a completely, that was not the right reason to fight from a Islamic perspective. And they lost anyway. When you have a situation where the Zionists are fighting for their lives and they would have been fighting for their lives. And you have the Arabs, they were Muslim, but they weren't fighting for Islamic reasons. What's going to happen? People are fighting for their lives, wanting to fight harder. Whereas the outside people, the Arabs coming from different countries, are, why are we killing ourselves for this other land that's not even ours? Let's go back home. And that's what, that is what wound up happening. So that's a deeper story. And people might think that the West helped Israel. And that's not exactly what happened. The West did not help Israel. Actually, in that 1948 war, they didn't really help Israel all that much. I know people think now, yes, Israel gets a lot of help from the West. But in 1948, it wasn't so clear. Israel mm. was just, the Israelis, they weren't, it wasn't really Israel yet, but the Israelis at that time were just more organized. They had a more concrete reason to fight. They were fighting for their lives. And for them, they had more, they had much more to lose if they lost. Whereas the Muslims did not have as much to lose. Mm. Except for the Palestinians, of course, they lost everything. But that's because mm. people they depended on weren't fighting for a solid cause, a good reason. Okay. Jazakallah khair for that. The next thing I wanted to touch, and obviously you've got episodes on the whole history of this that people can check out. So I just wanted to touch on it because then people can go and check those episodes out. Definitely. So one thing I wanted to get your take on was I once heard a, a sheikh say, I think it was Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, but I can't mm -hmm. remember exactly. And uh, it was about how before you go into Islamic history, make sure that your faith is strong and make sure, yeah, make sure your faith is strong because you're going to learn about a lot of things that might affect your faith. Yeah. And the question behind that was me, myself, sim in a similar way to why I respect people that are on the front line in Dawah is because essentially they're engaging with the enemy in the sense that they're on the front line, they're exposing themselves to all these philosophies and stuff like in a, on a deep level that perhaps only really ap appeals to 2% of atheists or less than that, like the militant ones that want to engage in all of that. And I feel like that's something that I couldn't do because I just rather maintain, there's that saying where you say like, I'll have tranquility instead. And mm -hmm. I know that's the work that they're doing for the sake of Allah, may Allah reward him for that. But everyone has a different personality. And then in terms of Islamic history, I remember like reading certain parts and also listening to your podcast as well. And when you hear about betrayals and the backstabbings and the caliphate here, and it's just, you just feel a bit dejected. And the reason is now, even now, if there's a fight on the street somewhere between kids or whatever, sometimes people will say the line, like you're both Muslim. Like, why are Muslims fighting each other? We don't fight that kind of thing, like brothers and stuff. And then you think back to like Islamic history and you just mm -hmm. think of the devastating things of like 50 years after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So much, what would be your comments on that? Yeah, there, it's not much different than, from what we have now. People, every government or any regime, any government is going to fight to protect itself. They're, and in a society that contains millions of people, Everyone is not going to be happy with that government. And there will be some who will take their happiness to the point where they'll try to overthrow that government. And the government is going to fight to maintain itself. The uh, Perhaps the most the best example is the fight between Maui and Ali during the, the second the second fitna, I believe that's the second fitna. No, I said the first, that's the first fitna. So the fight between Maui and Ali, both sides justified themselves Islamically. Both sides had reasons why they can justify why they justify their actions. Now we tend to say that Ali was correct, but if you look at it, what would you expect Maui to do? You can't, it's impossible. If you try to put yourself into their shoes, try to see it from their perspective, it's very hard to say, I don't want to say it's very hard, but if you try and be fair, you just can't say he should have just did this. It's very easy to make these declarations thousands of years or hundreds of years after it's already happened, but we're not in that situation. So, that is a, one of the things where you have, we have to understand that humans are humans and we're going to have our disagreements. 
family fights each other, even families who are directly related to each other. Muslims fight each other now, individual Muslims, Muslim groups fight against other Muslim groups, Muslim countries fight against other Muslim countries, Muslims within the same country fight against each other. So this is just part of human history, a part of the humanity of us all. And it's not like this wouldn't happen in other countries or other societies as well. Pretty much every society has some sort of civil war, no matter what its background is. The United States is no different. So it is just, it is up, upsetting. I do want to, and at first I was very, I was very uncomfortable with these situations, with these things I got, especially as I was going through that first fitna, I was going through the, the assassination of Uthman, anhu, and then the rise of Ali and People were, I received emails from people saying, you shouldn't talk about this topic. And even now in much of, if you go to many Islamic seminary schools, or we don't really say seminary school, but you go to a Dar al -Nun right now, they really don't get into the history until the higher levels of it. But in the basic levels, they don't really talk about this history that really impacts us all. It's very rare. In fact, I've heard from many Muslim scholars saying, these things don't have any impact on us right now. It's best just to leave it alone Why bring up old things. And I was no. Yeah, yeah, I always felt that was a very weak way of addressing the, a very important issue because people are going to be curious about it. The more you say don't look at something, the more someone's going to look at it. So that's going that's not going to help at all. And it's also just, let's say we should hate this group of people or we should dislike this group of people. These are not true Muslims, but you don't tell us why. And there has to be more reason to it. And part particularly between Sunni and Shia, if we're going to say that the Shia are wrong or the Shia are not right, then give us a reason. Why what is the history behind it? And also let's understand it from the Shia side as well. What is their reasoning for behind it? And it's not really as simple and straightforward as the hate of Sahaba. It's much more to it than that. And it is unfortunate. Basically, overall, I know I'm going down a long road, but essentially it is, you really should try to have your man together, try to be open-minded and understand that these people were humans. Also understand that we don't have perfect documentation of all of these of all of these actions especially the first fitna we have much of what we have comes from the shia side of things because the shia were more diligent about recording their side of the story and their side of the history we don't have that much from the ahlus sunnah wal jamaa side as we don't have as much from that side that's originally from that side so why also, would you say sorry why would you say they were more diligent in recording it there for the Shia, for the Shia, the history between the Fitna is their reason for being. The mm -hmm. Battle of Karbala, they, for the Battle of Karbala from a side of a Sunni Muslim, the Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we see it as a tragic event. It's a tragic event that we wish didn't happen, but it happened, mashallah. But from the Shia side, this is the big event. This is the thing that really proves that those who follow the first three righteous khulafa, those who call themselves Sunni, this is proof that they're on the wrong. This, they were willing to kill the prophet's grandson. They were willing to wipe out much of the prophet's family. This shows this is their part of their theology, basically. So it's very important to them to maintain it. But for us, it's, just, it's a tragic event. It's, mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not minimizing it or anything, but for it is not part of the reason for being. It's not like the conquest yeah. of Africa or anything. Yeah, like it's that. not like an existential. Yes. For the Sharia, this is similar to the conquest of Mecca. The, this is the proof that Islam, for the, us, the conquest of Mecca is the culmination of the Prophet's victory, culmination of everything. And he died two years later. But for the Sharia, I'm not saying that they don't care, care about the conquest of Mecca, but this thing here, the Battle of Karbala, that is the thing that began the separation between, it really began the separation between Sunni and Sharia. And it accelerated on from there through many different things, but that was the beginning of the break. Mm. One point I wanted to touch on is like, I mentioned at the start how it's easy to forget the details and oh, having done all the research for all the episodes, you've experienced that as well. But the good thing to keep in mind is there's a big difference between being completely ignorant and then being in a position or like a mental frame where you have some form of an understanding, but you know where to go to get more and that the answers are there and that the history exists and the sources essentially, because then now I know if I want to ever like refresh my mind, I go over my notes, I'll check out your podcast episode on that, refer to different books and stuff. So it's a, it's a different kind of a way of having a stronger identity you don't feel as though how you were saying how after the aftermath of 9-11 how some muslims felt 
they weren't in a position to defend Islam. Mm-hmm. So it's not that you're going to have to memorize all the details because you can't, <laughs> but right. it's more so just like having a, a, an understanding, uh, obviously along with the Sira or importantly with the Sira, and then trying to build upon that whenever it piques your interest. Because me personally, recently, I've made more of a concerted effort to memorize aspects of the Sira, the facts and figures kind of thing that right. are hard to memorize by using like a, a, what's the word, Anki, which is like software, what's it called, timed repetition kind of thing. Okay. Because I thought as Muslims, we should put more emphasis on that. We should try and memorize as much of the little details as possible about the life of the Prophet Wasallam. But in terms of everything else, it's good to just have a general grasp of it. A little aside is... How do you deal with, just on a personal level, right? Because you've done all this, because you've done all this research into various aspects of Islamic history, the major conflicts, um, current conflicts. How many times in a day do you have facepalm moments where like you hear someone, (laughs) where like you hear someone and obviously a lot of these conflicts involving different nationalities and stuff, those people are going to be very passionate. And then you hear someone saying something that you just know is not, historically accurate and you want to how do you deal with that should i say something should i because uh, i'll let you get into it but like a an example i have is if you've studied a little bit and you start learning about fiki differences and like how it all comes from a different methodology of like uh, how a hadith was interpreted and it all makes sense essentially if you go into comparative fic but if you go from that position to someone who's never done that at all you're in that state of needless moon wars debates and like this stuff that's not a big deal but the average kind of person makes it into a big deal and it's i'm guessing you feel like that with a lot of aspects with islamic history yeah all the time there's there's a common thing to try to modernize we'll see with prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam there's a common every great figure especially in modern history many great figures every society try to tries to grab on them every group every ideology tries to prove that person was really part of their group or really would have supported them. An example would be Malcolm X, who was a uh, famous Black Muslim civil rights activist, but for, as far as we know, he wasn't very knowledgeable in Islam when he died, but he did his best to what he had. He was fairly devout from what we can see. But I see so many groups trying to pull him into the ideology. He would have never accepted that ideology. It, same with Martin Luther King, who was, even though he was Christian, he was a devout Christian. People trying to prove that he would have been into all of these very liberal ideologies that he would probably never have been of because he was a very conservative Christian. And now we see the same thing with Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where a lot of people, generally Muslims, but they try to modernize him and turn him into this, I don't know, some sort of modern cafe, a coffee, cappuccino drinking hippie where who was all peace and love and everything and flowers. And that's not who the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was from my, from my reading of it. He led war. He led wars. He had battles. He sometimes ordered the execution of his enemies and also people who broke certain rules. He had to do these sort of things to establish his society. And I don't have any problem with accepting that. I don't have any problem with accepting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, may have sent people to assassinate his enemies. I have no problem accepting that. Mm. He was a warrior. It was necessary at the time, mashallah. If I was alive and the prophet asked me to do it, I would hopefully, vol- I hope I would have been able to volunteer to do it for him. If mm. he asked me to do it. The point is that, so recently I put a video out talking about the prophet's children. And one of his, I think his second son, Ibrahim, was born from a concubine, basically a female. Maria. Son. Yeah, Maria Kub- al Kubatiya who was a gift from the Egyptian king, or the, no, not the Egyptian king, the Egyptian patriarch, Christian patriarch in, the, in Egypt. Was it Mukakis or? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. he wound up being beat by Ibn Asr later on. But yeah, he she was a gift basically. And I know in our modern world, we don't like the idea of concubine. But during the prophet's time and up until very recently, and as for historically speaking, it wasn't really a big deal. It wasn't considered a big deal. She was mm-hmm. his concubine. She was, she, he never married her. She was a slave. She never accepted Islam for us. There are, there are some disagreements about whether she accepted Islam. Be fair about that one. But as far as I'm aware, he never married her. She's not considered part of his list of wives in all the cedar that I've seen. And he had, and I wrote that he had two concubines actually that we know of. He also had a Jewish woman who was also one of his Serene. concubines. Yeah, I think Saria something. I can't remember her name right now. But she wound up, I believe she wound up accepting Islam later on. There's more concrete evidence that she accepted Islam than Maria did. 
And also the prophet tried to marry her, but she refused. From other, the prophet wanted to marry her and asked her to marry him, but she said, no, the, situ the, the current situation we have is fine. So she was happy just being a concubine, not having to accept the responsibility of being a wife. She's happy with just being a concubine. But the point of the matter is he had children with, he had a child with Maria. And I mentioned that she was his concubine. And in the notes or in the comments, someone said, the prophet didn't have any concubines. He married all of his wives. And it's very easy. Just go to sunnah.com, type in the word concubine. You get a bunch of hadiths about the prophet with his the prophet with his concubines, other co companions with their concubines. It's not really that difficult to find out. So I just took this link and pasted it over there. I just said, please do some research. It's not that difficult to do these sort of things. Mm. And I don't think there's a reason, I don't think there's a need for us to try to modernize the prophet to fit with modern standards. We assume, I can go so far into this, but- I completely agree. And this is so it was our ideology that, that we have now didn't fit with back then. The things that we accept now as normal in society now would have been mind blowing to go back then. And they would have thought, they would think that we are crazy. If they see the things that we accept now as Muslims and in society as general. Yeah. And it's so sad to see how currently in on the Muslim speaker circuit, let's say, Mm -hmm. how it's th just this one version of Islam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that's portrayed and it gives it's giving a whole generation like a warped idea of yeah. the reality and it's like soon like it might get to a stage where that's so common even now sometimes it's like the reality is so much of a shock to people that they're, they're not even willing to believe it and it's like, which is why Alhamdulillah, there is a relatively good kind of reactionary movement, let's say, in terms of Ustad Daniel Hey Hadju and how people like the unapologetic way he can defend certain things like slavery and Islam and like how he dismantles the philosophies. Because uh, just aside, though, like most people only listen to the videos and they don't go into it. But if you actually study some of his courses where he breaks down the philosophies, once you see that, it gives you a different lens to view modern secularism and liberalism. And I think sometimes because of people's initial kind of shock judgment, they don't want to go into it. But, and then a, another example is how in Pakistan, there was Alama Khadim Rizvi. I'm not sure if you heard of him, but he, he passed away a couple of years ago, which allegedly from natural sources, but obviously there's conspiracies that he was, and he was doing these marches and stuff. And it, it started off as like a passion movement from protecting the honor of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and like uh, trying to prevent different laws being removed like the blasphemy laws and marches about kicking out the french ambassador and things like this and the amount of traction that he got i would say it stopped it stopped a certain liberalization of pakistani policies and politics for a generation because i feel like amongst the masses there was so much uproar that the people who are mostly just secular liberals at the top in politics, they realize that this is not something that we can poke yet, even though they're doing it on the sly with different think tanks and stuff like that. But, mm -hmm. and he, I remember seeing a clip of him where Brother Majid mentioned, he mentioned the same incident, but he didn't mention Allah Muhammad, but he was talking about the incident of, that's often narrated to us as kids about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam an old woman throwing dirt on him and then the next day him going again and then him going again and then Alama Khadim Rizvi was just like come on what are you trying to suggest that every day the prophet is going to go down the same path to get stuff thrown on him sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then go again and and that kind of notion and then also about love and peace and stuff and all the rest of it he has some very powerful kind of quotes that captured people's imagination but Anyway, yeah, so another kind of particular history question, just my own curiosity. And then I wanted to go into certain tech, like podcast related questions and sure. process related questions. And that was the question on Pakistan, right? Because I know I haven't actually listened to that episode, I think, or I okay. might have. But so you've studied that kind of history of the formation of Pakistan and stuff. Yeah. And it's a very touchy subject, as you can imagine. So being from Pakistan, but. Mm. Uh, I want to just put out there that I am quite ignorant about the topic, which is why I'm asking you, but I don't want too much to go into it too much, but okay. I just don't understand how, as far as I understood, like one of the main things behind creating the nation of Pakistan 
was like a Muslim nation. And obviously feel free to add and correct once I turn it over to you. And then I just don't get how as soon as this, the partition happened, more Muslims ended up in India. More Muslims ended up in India than there are in Pakistan from day one. And to me, that's just, what's the point then? As in, and then obviously forget all the politics of how it's left with secular liberals in government that are just like messing around for 40 years. But what, can you like shed some light on that and perhaps like the reasons behind yeah. it and so Actually, my research on Pakistan, I actually work with a Pakistani American brother who lives here in the United States. He was a fan like you, and we wound up meeting and talking and I really linked on him because he's a little bit older than me. So he grew up in Pakistan and came to the United States as an adult. So I don't know if he studied here, but he definitely lives and works here now. So I lean, he grew up with the in the Pakistani school system and everything. So I mention his name all the time, Zulfi Kostaros. I don't think you'll mind me mentioning his name, but he's the one who really helped me understand pa Pakistan's evolution and its growth and everything. One of the first questions that I had for him actually, when we really started talking about history because he's a history fan as well. I asked him, why is Pakistan always having so many problems compared to India? And I know, I do know India is not perfect, but India seems to have less problems with Pakistan. And he told me about the, and this is a, uh, an episode I encourage you and you listen to, the three A's of Pakistan. He said Pakistan's development has been guided by the three A's. Allah, which is basically the religion of Islam, the army, and America. And that's basically America's obviously the American influence on Pakistani politics and everything. And he really gave me a lot of information about how those three aspects, the religious society of Pakistan, the military society of Pakistan, and the United States influence on Pakistan's development has really changed Pakistan or really forced Pakistan in a certain direction. The military took over Pakistan really almost from its very beginning. And this happens in a lot of Muslim countries. The military is like the strongest, the strongest force. And the civil, the civilian government is really works at the behest of the military government. And I don't, I'm not as involved with Pakistani politics right now. I'm saying involved. I'm not as aware of it as I am as I was when I was preparing for these episodes. Put in perspective, when I did my research on Pakistan, Imran Khan was just became the prime minister. There's a lot of optimism that he would finally the things are changing in Pakistan. It was stopping a puppet of the United States. And now we're here just a few months after he was forced out. And I don't want to get you in trouble, so I'm not going to go too far <laughs> into it. I don't know how much is going to get into it. But I, basically, the I, even I heard that now that his story was partially done by the Pakistani military. A lot of those bets, I don't know how much influence they had on that. But Pakistan's military has always had a huge influence. Also, the very formation of Pakistan with East Pakistan, which is now in Bangladesh, in between with the with this, a hostile nation, basically India, in between East and West Pakistan, there's almost no way that's going to succeed. So with there's almost no way India would have found regardless of talk about Hindus, Muslims, any kind of religious thing, just from a purely pol political government perspective, if I know that I have two, I have a nation that's split in half and they're potentially my rivals and my enemies. I'm going to try to weaken them. And India did that by taking Bangladesh, was down Bangladesh away from, or separating Bangladesh from the total Pakistani government or total Pakistani entity. It's, Pakistan also has a problem with its terrain. It basically just doesn't have the, the it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a much smaller country than India. So it doesn't have as much natural resources as India has. And as I mentioned, wealth does help a lot. And Pakistan spends so much of its wealth on defense, on military spending, that it doesn't really have as much to really develop its country the way that India has. So there's lots of reasons, but I will say the beginning of the problem was just a very structure with the East and West Pakistan and all of India in between them. That was a recipe for the nation being split apart. And from there, Everything. And there's also mistakes by the government. Zulfikar, I can't remember his Ali name. Is. Uh, but yeah, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto made a lot of mistakes. He had he has some lofty goals, but he was part of the problem with, with the division of the two nations of East and West Pakistan. And then his successor, Ziaul Haq, getting Pakistan involved with America, with the CIA and the Afghan war. There's so much of that. <laughs> that was just, oh boy. That was just, yeah. that has led to weird. That has just led to all the problems in the Swat Valley and the and the Pakistan Taliban and all the things with, with the war on terrorism. There's so much involved in that. Like I said, these things, everything has a history. So uh, people will look at Pakistan and think that Pakistan is just a failed society. It's not. It's, 
you go back to Ziaul Haq and his involvement with the CIA has set Pakistan up to really suffer. And they, I don't know, I don't know how things are in Swat Valley now with all the problems that they had back maybe about 10 years ago. I don't know if those things are still going on now. But Pakistan lost over 60,000 people throughout the war on terrorism. That's a huge amount for a nation that's supposed to be the United States ally. Lost a lot of people in that. So Pakistan has suffered a lot due to its alliance with the United States. And there's just so much more to it that it's hard to get into with in a short period of time. I don't want to keep, keep mm. sorry, but this it's just so much. Those three, yeah. listen to that episode, the three A's yeah. of Pakistan. Jazakallah, definitely. But just the starting point about how when they had this vision for Pakistan, did they expect all Muslims to be on that side? Or I don't know right. if it's, that's the bit that I struggle with. Okay, Pakistan formed next day, or well, obviously I'm simplifying it. After mm -hmm. the whole migration is done, there's more Muslims on that side. Is it okay then? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It would have been impossible, I think, for every Muslim. Pakistan is like the second largest Muslim country right now after Indonesia. It's one of the largest Muslim countries in the world. I don't know, and it, it doesn't have the natural resources that India has, because half of the Pakistan is pretty much desert, with the Lochistan province, and much of that is really just desert and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really have the natural, I don't know if it would have the natural resources to support if all, I don't know, two or 300 million Muslims have moved from India back mm -hmm. in 1947 to Pakistan. And Bangladesh, we're talk about East Pakistan, which is mo mostly Bangladesh now, that's something totally mm -hmm. different. I don't know if it could have even managed all that without having more of, even if it had Kashmir and that may have helped, but that would not have been enough to completely support all of those people. And generally speaking, it's very hard. India is a huge country. India is gigantic. Much, a, a large portion of the Muslim community, Muslim, Indian Muslims live in the Deccan area. It was called the Deccan Plateau in South Central, in like so Southern India. It would have been very difficult for all those people to move. Hmm. all of a sudden all the way across and with all the violence hmm. going on with the with the uh, partition at the time hmm. it just would have been unlikely for everyone to have left and also india would not have wanted all the muslims to leave either it's in their natural it's in their best interest to to promise at least protection and security to the muslims or whatever they could do to make them stay for to convince them to stay and everyone didn't agree with Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Every Muslim did not agree with him. He had to convince a lot of Muslims to go along with him. And every Muslim in India at the time did not agree with his vision. And so many of them didn't want to go. And so it's just it's just natural that millions of Muslims would prefer to stay where they already were in India. Mm. They just couldn't come if it, and eventually just decide to just, let's just accept with what we have right now. I know a lot of Pakistani friends of mine who now will be their parents and grandparents who came or not even the parents, really grandparents and great grandparents now who came over from during the partition and all. It was just, it's just impossible for everyone to move. Yeah. And I don't know if Pakistan could have really supported all those people anyway. Okay. So I need to start bringing it towards a close. So, okay. Just uh, relatively quickly then, if you could share one of your favorite stories from Islamic history, let's say after the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or a, like a lesser known tidbit of Islamic history that you think it would be good if more people knew about. Okay. I mean, uh, it doesn't have any real impact on our society in general, but it was one of my favorite episodes to do was I recently did an episode on the Vikings, on the Muslim interaction with the Vikings. And I, I learned a lot about it and it was actually fun. Most of the history is fun, but sometimes you get into some very tragic things. But I think the episode in the Vikings, which was, I don't know, I best I can say, it, it was a fun, it was, it was basically talking about Ibn Fadlan, who was a Muslim scholar from Baghdad. He traveled to yeah. a Viking society in, in what is now Russia, basically. And he learned about the Vikings and just hearing about his, reading about his perception, because he wrote everything down that he saw and witnessed and reading about how disgusted yet academic he was very intellectual and academic but he was disgusted by the vikings way it was very interesting and very fun to read it it was like a, everyone like looks a fish out of water story or a person in a new society feeling like an alien in a new society and seeing how he tried to <laughs> reconcile the way the vikings were acting but trying to be an unbiased scholar and just recording everything it was a very interesting story and i, I would encourage people to listen to that one it's still it's available now it's called Vikings and Muslims, I think, so Muslim and Vikings, something like okay. that. Part How part. recent was this? That's, oh, that this has been uploaded? Yeah, maybe February, not even March. I'll say sometime during Ramadan, I believe. So it's probably April, about April yeah. or so. Okay. So it's have, you, have you done a previous one? Because I'm sure I've heard like the remarks of that scholar on Viking society and how 
he makes some funny remarks and I'm uh, so was that not a previous Islamic history one or maybe I heard it somewhere it may have come up in some of my other stories or some mm. of my other articles. so it may have come up but only as a tan tangential I didn't really go into the research of it this time I really went into the research of it and mm. I compared it to the movie that was based upon it called The 13th Warrior it came out about 20 22 years ago starring Kendrick Munga Antonio Banderas, yeah. So and so, there's a movie about it. The movie is completely garbage. <laughs> the movie has nothing mm. to do with the real history. It's related to the real history, but that's not the mm. end on there. It was nice. To, I always thought before I did the research, I thought that the movie was fairly accurate. It is not. I did a comparison of the real history <laughs> the as well. But yeah, that was one of my favorite ones. But yeah, I think it was back in Ramadan of this mm. past year. I did. Yeah, definitely. So I've made a note. I'll try and link that in the description and we've got the three A's of Pakistan as well. So now I know you mentioned another interesting thing that obviously I remembered when I was listening to it on Brother Marge's podcast and just my own experiences. If you could talk about the different phases of your content creation, because I like the way when people check it out, they'll see it. you, there's times where you use different voices, which obviously makes the narration of the story a lot easier. It's a lot more easier to follow, especially when it's just an audio only format where you like impersonate different characters. Alhamdulillah, I think that's brilliant way of getting the message across and teaching people. So I, I, you mentioned how you took the idea from hardcore history and then developed it from there. So just outline your arc in terms of the creation of Islamic history podcast and to where it is now. Briefly. Yeah, it's still a work in progress because I'm trying to find the perfect blend of things. I started off just making notes of everything. So the first season, really the second season, which is really about the, the four righteous caliphs, that was mostly, I just took down notes of the different events and just, I didn't read the notes per se, but I would look at the notes and talk about that for a little bit, then go to the next note, talk about that for a little bit. So it was mu very much, very much conversational, I, I would say. So there was a lot more pauses I, as I'll gather my thoughts or maybe I might stumble a little bit and then go back and correct myself and things like that so it was much more much more casual then I started getting into audiobooks I listened to a lot of audiobooks I really liked the way audiobooks sounded even historical audiobooks for instance there's an audiobook on Alexander Hamilton who was a, one of the founding fathers of the United States I listened to that and I really liked that one there's lots of different, I like lots of fiction audiobooks. I'm not going to say them because people say Muslims shouldn't be listening to these sort of things. I won't say them, but I, listen, <laughs> I like, a, I also listen to uh, fiction as well. <laughs> so yeah. some of the fiction includes fantasy and science fiction and stuff like that. And I really like the way they did the voices in those things. And I said, let me put this in the podcast for a while. Some people liked it. Some people didn't. So I left it alone, but I tried to really? just improve some my Some people voice. didn't. Yeah. Some people didn't like it. It's, it's kind of sounds mm. weird and it's a work in progress so i went on i started doing more of just voice acting or i don't say voice acting just modulating my voice instead and that's still a work in progress some people say it's boring and it's hard to really find the mix because i like the politics of whatever history is going on i like the politics that's involved as well as the i don't like the war but i like studying the war and the tactics and everything that that goes on with it and the politics can sometimes be boring i understand that it can be very to really understand it, it can be, it can drag things on, but some, I feel it's necessary to talk about, to get a full understanding. And it can be mm -hmm. difficult to listen to someone talk about these things. And really, I'm just reading from a screen. Of late, I'm going, my next season, inshallah, I just finished, the last full season I did was about the war in Bosnia in the 1990s. And that was very complicated and very involved and lots of research involved in that one. But it was very in-depth. I don't think I left any stone unturned, anything I could get, that I could discuss with that one, trying to helping people understand the full story behind that conflict. Next, I'm going to do, inshallah, the Mughal Empire. And, mm. and this time, the research is mostly done, but I'm going to go back to my original way of just having notes, not reading from a full screen, and just having notes, talk about that, and go to the next episode, go to the next topic and talk about that for a little while. So most of the recent episodes I've done, which I call bonus episodes, so the one with the Viking one, for instance, is an example. And I did one on the Sokoto Caliphate. I have one coming out soon about Malik Ambar, who was in, that's why I talk about the Deccan Plateau because it's in my mind right now. He was an Ethiopian. He was an Ethiopian commander of one of the Deccan Sultanates in India. And so that's coming out, inshallah, in, about, in a couple of weeks. So mm. those, I'm not reading any more from a script. I'm not trying to be a voice actor or anything like that. I'm going back to just doing my notes and just reading using my notes as a jump off point and just talking about it offhand and hopefully make it less 
static and less boring for people. It's always a it's always a struggle trying to find out what's best for most people. Okay, so I got loads of questions, like smaller questions, obviously about the whole <laughs> research process and stuff. So that I know since 2020, mashallah, I think you started using social media a lot more because I remember yeah. when we were in contact back then. Since then, you've gained more followers mashallah and because i definitely think there's an appetite for it out there you probably considered it but as like a suggestion from a fan i would say if you i think it would do well if you put yourself in the videos say like on instagram if you were like i know people don't like that as in like personally kind of thing like they some people feel comfortable with it but if you were to do like them reels where you're like i don't know it's hard with islamic history because it's such a nuanced topic yeah. It's hard to make it into 60 seconds, but I did notice in your recent YouTube videos, you've gone into that format of like, where it's illustrated. That's correct, isn't it? Like there is, there's more illustrations and like different images come up and stuff like that. So it makes it a, a bit more visually appealing. So is that something mm -hmm. new that you've tried and how do you do the, do you outsource that or what's the process? No, no, I, I, um, there's not much outsourcing on my side. I, I, do, I do it all on, mostly on my own. The brother does help me with the research and stuff like that. But I have mm -hmm. already a whole bunch of podcasts already evidently going back to 2015. So I have dozens and dozens of podcasts that I can use. So the audio is already there. So that makes it a little bit easier. So I tried recently, as far as the YouTube channel is concerned, and I'm still struggling with YouTube. I haven't really found my way with YouTube. Recently, I've been trying to just find interesting topics that I think I'll just grab a clip for one of my older episodes, maybe five, six, seven minute clip, and then put that to video. And I try to find videos online that match the story and then add some effects to it to try to illustrate it a little bit more. But no, that's not a, that's not outsourced. The only thing that makes it easier is that because I have the podcaster rating, the audio is already done. So I don't have to do the audio mm -hmm. all over again. So I just had to put the audio in and then find a video to match it. And mm -hmm. that's it's still a bit of a struggle. I'm still trying to learn how to really do video. As far as yeah. putting myself in the video, the social media thing there, it's very difficult to add another thing to it. The social media thing is very... Uh, every now and then something might hit might my, my grab my interest and I might put it on social media. But generally speaking, it's hard to really focus on Instagram. I used to have my daughter do it, but now she doesn't want to do it anymore. So I have to mm. kind of do it on my own now. I just don't have the time. So it's, it's difficult yeah. trying to maintain. I have, a, I have two podcasts now. So I have the regular Islamic History podcast. Then I have the paid one, Islamic History Exclusive, which shows, which goes into different stories and everything, most of them about the Umayyad Khilafat and stuff like that. I have to maintain both of them. I have to prepare for the next season. And then also the YouTube channel. It's just too much to really add on to really yeah, get serious about social media. So with social media, I generally just maybe put one episode up or put a few, maybe one large story. Like recently, I think I did something on, on Africa, on, on Islam in Africa. And so I put that up there, maybe pay for a little bit of ad boost from Instagram so you can get more people in there. But I just don't have the bandwidth right now to be consistent about that. But I said the same thing about YouTube and now I found the bandwidth for it. So maybe inshallah, mm. I'll, I'll find yeah. a way to do that. As far as mm. getting in front of the camera myself, the main reason I don't get in front of the camera is because I podcast from my house. <laughs> I'm in my bedroom right now. And so I got this set up behind me to block out <laughs> the things I don't want people to see. But I don't, where my microphone is and where all my technology and everything is on the other side of the room that you can't see. And if I put myself in there, It'll take a lot to really set everything up and film it and everything. One day, inshallah, I hope to mm -hmm. get a bigger house or maybe a, my own office. I can find some room right now. But my bedroom mm -hmm. is a big mess and my wife's clothes are all over, my clothes are all over the place and not just my wife. And it's just, it's not conducive mm -hmm. to, to good videos. So I can't yeah. do that just yet. But maybe one day, I do want to, inshallah, one day. Mm -hmm. I have the equipment for it. I just don't have the space for it right now to really yeah. put myself in video. I would definitely love to do more face-to-face -face videos where it's just me talking about certain aspects of Islamic history and maybe just doing a short five minute video, 10 minute video, something like that. And supplement with historical archival shots and stuff like that. But it's just not, it's really a limitation of the space that I have right now. Yeah, because, and obviously that makes it even more inspiring to, because I remember once listening to one of your podcasts ages ago and you talking about how balancing it with work and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And obviously it's a very inspirational and may Allah reward you because it's hard, mm -hmm. even though mine, like managing mine, but I agree with you. Like once you get to that stage in terms of where you want to put yourself in front of the camera. Yeah. Because you just have to find a low resistance way of doing it that works for you. Cause just from my experience with this only recently, like the last month and a half, I've done consistent guest interview podcasts. Like I did one in 2020 and then one in 2021. And then now I've, I did more in 2021, but it wasn't consistent. 
Whereas now I found a, a system. You just have to find a system. The setup right. is just where my normal desk is for work. I've just got a ring light up. I've got this thing on the side. And then I just record the podcast and then chop it up into different clips that act as like content on its own. And then chop that up again into 60 second reels. So it's like the ratio between input and output isn't that much because it's like one bit of input and then the output is multiplied. And then little things as well, like little tools that help you is like Calendly, like the scheduling. Yeah. Go on, I'm sorry, go on. I'm interrupting. Go on. Yeah. I think there's, no, I was going to say like the, sometimes these little tools that you think are insignificant, like we have that David Goggins type mentality. I don't know if you've heard of him, but it's like yeah, where you just get yourself through it and stuff. And it's, but then these things make it easier. As in before, there's the thing in self development that the more resistance there is, the less likely you're going to do it. As in the more kind of cognitive yeah. resistance there is between anything. And it's like that because before I'd reach out to someone on Instagram. And then it's like, they might message the next day back and then it's, are you happy to do it? And they'd be like, yeah, I'm happy. And then you're like, okay, are you free next week? They'd be like, no. And you're just doing everything manually and you lose the motivation and stuff. And then, whereas with this Calendly, it's like, are you right, happy right. to do it? And they're like, yeah. And then send them the link and they schedule it themselves according to their time. And right, it cuts right. everything. It makes it so much easier. And what I'm trying to say by that is you find like a little system that works for you and then. The other thing with YouTube is I would suggest like collaboration is big because it's like the content on its own may get traction depending on the topic, um, which is why it's good to create multiple clips like you were saying, because essentially you're increasing the surface area for it to attach to some topic and get traction. And the more you do it, there's more chances of it. As long as you're getting a high click through rate and stuff, because otherwise some people say if you don't upload a thumbnail and you just pump out the content, you might not really get anywhere. But yeah, I was just sharing that to see if I could be of any assistance in terms of, but I think, yeah, I've got through everything that I wanted to, and which rarely happens because sometimes you have a list and I think I've managed to get through most of the things that I wanted to ask you about. And uh, I don't know if you wanted to say anything to finish off. Well, regarding, I know this was that one. Yeah, so, I'm sorry. Okay, no, well, yeah, carry on. Okay. Regarding the finding a system, one thing that's worked for me, and I know I do, like most of us, I work a 40 hour week job and got wife and kids and all these other things that pull out my attention. But I would suggest for anyone who's trying to build something on the side and you still got to work and got to worry about family or school or anything like that. The system that I suggest is on the days that you have to work, try to put one hour into your side business or side project or whatever is going on, at least one hour a day on those uh, days that you have to work. On the days that you don't have to work, whether it's the weekend or whatever, really try to grind a lot and get a lot of work done on the weekends or whatever your two days off or however many days you have off. This will help. And over time, you'll see that even if it's just an hour a day, if you can do that on the days that you work, it will all add up. And I know people can come back home and they're tired or you got to figure out what time of the day works for you best. But an hour a day on the days that you work or go to school, if that's what you're into, what you're doing right now. And then on the days that you have off, really try to put two or three or four hours into your side project and see how that will really allow you to get a lot of work, more work done. That's helped me a lot in trying to combine everything. And then also remember, it's, it's your project. You don't have to come out with a new episode every single week. It's yours. Mm. Don't put the pressure on yourself to come out with a new project every single week. Try to be somewhat consistent with it. Don't do once every six months. That's too, that's not good enough either. Take some, mm. take a break if you have to. And, you know, people who who rock with you, people who like what you're doing, they'll come back, inshallah. If they'll put out a new episode, they'll be there when they, when you put out a yeah. new episode. That's yeah, my advice. Doing that. Yeah, because with the Islamic History Podcast, it's definitely a bit like how that guy behind a Hardcore History, he uploads one episode like after ages. Yeah. Because, and I think with Islamic History, the each episode is contained or each topic is like, or each season is contained within itself kind of thing. So it's yeah. like an evergreen kind of form of content that, it's timeless, mashallah. And also, obviously, we were talking practically, but obviously, we don't really have to worry that much about results if the intention's there. So sometimes mm -hmm. it's easy to get into the results, but then just back out and focus on intention and effort and understand that the reward is commensurate to that rather than the actual metrics. So that's another one. But you reminded me, actually, because I don't know why I would have regretted cutting off the interview without asking you. I was going to ask you about, so that's how you manage it, essentially, that tip about, working one day, uh, one hour a week, one hour a day when you're at work or on a working day. Yeah. Because 
any other tips in terms of managing your schedule or like things like that? Because I would say give you definitely give yourself a even on the days that I, like for me this is a, Sunday is a weekday for me. I don't work today, and on Saturdays and Sundays when I have when I don't have to work, and I put most of my effort into creating a new episode or trying to get a new project done on these days. I tell myself to uh, basically, I get off at eight o'clock PM at the very latest. I try to finish things up at eight o'clock PM. And that's the time when I play video games, watch movies, spend time with my kids. And sometimes I take a full day off. You have to have time to relax. If you don't, yeah. then uh, it is important to have some time to relax, take some time off for yourself. Not, I think a lot of the problems really the suppression of trying to consistently create content and you don't, it is, I know you want to do it and maybe you might even get your fans telling you, bro, we're going to put on another episode. I'm waiting for a new episode. And I know that we feel beholden to our fans and we feel that like we have an obligation to them. We do have some obligation to our fans and our followers, people who, who uh, like our content and stuff like that. We do have an obligation to them. We have an obligation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have an obligation to your family. You have an obligation to yourself. If you're not taking care of yourself, you can't do these things for everyone else. Spend some time at the gym or exercising, whatever it is you need to do. Take some time to relax, play video games, get your work done first and <laughs> say, and give yourself a time limit. And if you miss it, if you miss a deadline, you're the boss. So give yourself a new deadline. If your deadline was for Monday, give yourself a deadline on Tuesday. You're the boss. You can change your deadline however you want and just do the best you can and apologize if you have to afterwards or don't apologize. It's not that important. It's not yeah. that big of a deal. But the thing is that you got to take some time to relax, give yourself a time to, to knock off work or your project, whatever it is. And, uh, Whatever it is you need to gather yourself back. But as always, try and get the big things done first. And I know one one thing I found is very useful is just making a list of things you want to get done for the day or for the week. Maybe the week is better. So you write down everything you want to get done for your week. I usually put them on a whiteboard. I have it behind me right now. You, you can't see it, but it's back there on the other side of the, mm. the camera. Have a list of things I want to get done and just go through it for the whole week. So got to research this. I got to prepare for a khutbah. I got to do this, I gotta do that, and just research and one by one, knock it out. And these can be even be personal items. Gotta go to the store, gotta take a doctor's appointment, gotta do this, gotta put that down on, on your list and one by one, check them off. And inshallah, you'll find you get a lot more things done. If you have a mental list of what of things you want to do and not just try to memorize everything, because that's not gonna always work. So those are the tips yeah. I have. Be prepared to relax and make a list and check them off as you can. A week list, I think, is better than a, than a a weekly list is better than a daily list is what I was trying to say. Yeah, because it gives you like that element of flexibility if necessary, swap things right. around and stuff like that. Okay, exactly. so this was, uh, alhamdulillah, like probably one of my favorite uh, episodes. And yeah. I'm very grateful, uh, Jazakallah Khair, for giving oh, yeah. me your time. And uh, yeah, I my duas are with you, your projects and everything. And once it's uploaded, I'll let you know. And yeah, so assalamu alaikum. Uh, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Brother Adil. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim.